It's vision day, and I want to tell you that today, I want to warn you, it's going to be like drinking from a fire hydrant. So just be warned as you gather with your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers, whoever's there in your uh, neighborhood gathering right now, uh, just turn to them and say, hey, get ready, get ready, because here we go. Uh, this Because this is something that's been stirring in me for a couple of years now. In fact, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the culmination of conversations our staff has been having, conversations I've had with other pastors in our community, and uh, conversations we've had with our leadership team, our advisory board, and and it's all brought us to this moment, what we call Vision Day. And I also want to thank a, a couple of uh, leaders in the church today who've really influenced a lot of what we're talking about today. Uh, Mark Sayers is an author and a pastor in Australia, and uh, Pete Scazeros is also a former pastor and author and podcaster, and a lot of what they talk about has really inspired us uh, as a church over the last couple of years, and so I'm th so thankful for those men. But it's uh, every year um, there's a different word that I believe God has for us, and uh, you remember last year's word? Uh, rest. It was the year of rest, and I uh, had no idea... Um, how uh, prophetic or pathetic that was going to be uh, based on how you look at it because everything shut down and we were, all, we were all resting. But as we went through the pandemic, one of the things I was talking about, a word that God gave me during the pandemic was the word abide. And I, I just kept saying that over and over again, abide, abide, draw close, draw close into God because if you'll draw close to God, he's got, he's got a vision, he's got a um, dreams for you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to carry you through this. And for those of you that, that have done that, you've seen that. I've heard the stories of what God is doing in your life. And near the end of 2020, God, I, I felt, moved us from this word abide to the word endure, that people were tired. They were wore down, and they, they were ready to, I mean, just all the political unrest, the um, racial unrest, the pandemic, and it was just, was just time to just check out. Just, I'm finished. And but, but God says, no, endure. If you will endure, those who endure to the end will see my promises. Those who endure to the end will see the blessings and the revelations of God. And we need to endure. But I believe where God is leading us now into 2021 is to engage. I want you to write that word down, engage. God is calling us now to move out and engage with him and engage with people. Come on, turn to somebody wherever you are and tell them it's time to engage. It's time to engage. Let's pray. Father, in the moments that we have together, would you impart your vision to us so that we can engage with you and engage with others in the way in which you've called us to do that as the church in Jesus' name. Wherever you are, say amen. Well, Valentine's Day is coming up. It's uh, next Sunday. Uh, gentlemen, you're welcome. Friendly reminder for you. Uh, but, you know, the one thing we know about Valentine's Day is um, it's the day that women completely manipulate men. Come on, guys. I'm going to speak on behalf of every man right now. Oh, don't, don't talk to anybody in your gathering. Right. Just listen for a moment. Listen to me, ladies, okay? Because this is a day, like, we know you, you get us a card, you, you take us to dinner, and we know what you're after, we know the one thing that you want. And on behalf of men, I want to say, we're not a piece of meat, okay? <laughs> we have feelings. Sometimes we just, we just want to talk. <laughs> anyway, sometimes in a relationship, relationships, you know, they're supposed to be passionate. Not just one day, not just Valentine's Day. You know, Valentine's Day is the day of passion. But it's not reserved for that, that day and like the anniversary. Those are the only times there's passion in, in a relationship. But let's just be honest, in a relationship, the passion can wane. Um, it, it, the lo you know this, any relationship you've been in, it, it just the longer you're together, you kind of just kind of take each other for granted. Um, I mean, you're just, they're, they're always going to be there, they always are there. Um, you, you, get, you get comfortable, and pretty soon, instead of being passionate in the relationship, you become passive. And I, I believe the same thing can happen in our relationship with Jesus, uh, it, all of us desire to be passionate followers, but it's so easy to get comfortable. It's so easy to become a passive observer, and you don't even notice it's happening. It, it happens to all of us. You, you just get comfortable, and um, I mean, you, you, you kind of take Jesus for granted. Like, he's, 
He's always there, right? He said, I, I will never leave you. I will, I will never forsake you. And you just get comfortable. And I believe this is exactly what has been happening in the American church. We become comfortable, and the American church has become passive. We become passive observers. It's, it's what I would call um, the Sunday church. Like, you look at this. Let me, here's an example. I think this is what has is, is happened. Like, in the 1940s and 50s, pretty much it seemed like everybody went to church. Um, and that was just the thing. You did. Even if you weren't a follower of Jesus, you, you went to church. And then the next day, you go to work, and you would talk about your experience at church. And that's not the case anymore. In fact, people that don't know Jesus... They don't even attend. They don't even come on Sundays anymore. They're not, in fact, people who don't know Jesus, they got up this morning, they weren't, it wasn't even on their radar to even think remotely about church. What's crazy, though, is uh, research has showed us, and, and survey after survey is revealing that that's not just on people who are not coming to church, but it's those who are coming to church. Like, those who would call themselves committed Christians are becoming more and more passive. They're they're attending church less and less frequently. In fact, most surveys show that and, and research shows that committed Christians are coming every other week or watching online every other week. And, and those who would say that they're, they're a follower of Jesus, they're not, they're not like, like crazy hardcore, but, they're, but they follow Jesus, they believe in Jesus, and, and, and they've been baptized. They would say, well, I... They go to church about every six to eight weeks, almost every other month, or they're online just occasionally. And, and, and what the result of that is that fewer and fewer people are connecting. In fact, what we're seeing is, is that people in the church in America, it's becoming very individualized. Like, I, I don't really need to connect. I can just, I can sit at home by myself. I don't, I don't really need other people. I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine, which is exactly what the enemy wants you to do, and less and less people are connecting and getting into what we would call a core group, into a community of, of believers, as we were, we were called by Christ to do, as he modeled for us. And, and then as a result of that, fewer and fewer people are inviting. They're not, like Christians and followers of Jesus aren't really thinking about their friends and their neighbors and their coworkers who don't know Jesus, and as a result, the, the world doesn't know, and the result, they're not coming and they're not, because they're not being invited. And then we see then less and less people, very, very few people are actually serving, like serving in the church and serving in the community, thinking about serving others. And what has happened is, is it's taking the American church from being passionate followers to becoming passive observers. And the impact on the world, as you can see, is just very, very small. And it's the world that's paying the price. I mean, we see it, chaos and confusion and brokenness and heartache and pain and, and divisiveness and, and injustice and depression and, and addiction on and on and on. This has happened on our watch, and we are the ones who are responsible. I want you to turn to somebody wherever you are and tell them, it is time to engage. It's time to engage. It's time to go from passive observers to passionate followers. And this is what I love about the people of Core Church. This is what I love about you because our church refuses to be like the norm. Our church says, no, we will not, we will fight against being passive. We will not be passive, but we will be passionate because we know that people desperately need the hope and the healing and the peace and the purpose of Jesus. So here's what we're gonna do. When the church in America looks kind of like this. We're getting ready to flip it on its head like this. Now, what's interesting is we're going to do things radically different. But yet, if you look at the Core Church logo on here, even though we're flipping things and we're doing things radically different, it's, it's still the same. What, what do I mean by this? What we're going to do is we're going to move from being the Sunday church to becoming the everyday church. Like, look, look at this, this here. We are gonna follow the life and the ministry of Jesus. This is what the church is called to do. We're not called to just be passive observers, but we're called to be passionate followers and engage every single day. And this is what Jesus did. He engaged with one, he engaged with three, he engaged with 12, and he engaged with one another. Now, when you see that, you can see that the impact on the world is overwhelming. 
That's why we want to do this. But I know you're asking, what do all those numbers mean? Like, what does that mean? Well, I want to take the next few minutes, and as best I can, I want to articulate this to you. And I want us to look at the life and the ministry of Jesus and see what it means to be the everyday church. So I hope you're writing down notes this morning because it's going to come fast, it's going to come furious. Uh, But I believe as we study these things, and you may want to revisit this later and watch again, but here's what I want you to write down first. Engage with one. Engage with one. Study and serve. Engage with one. Study and serve. Mark 135. You don't have to look it up because I'm going to be flying through a whole bunch of different scriptures today, but Mark 135 says this. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and he went out to what? Say it with me. An isolated place to pray. This is one of the most overlooked aspects of Jesus' ministry and life. He was constantly getting alone with the Father and praying because Jesus understood this. He knew that he had a mission, that he needed to be on mission, and the only way to know that mission was to be alone, to go to the Father in prayer, to hear from the Father so that he could walk out that mission. So here's the question I have for you. Do you have a time and place every day where you are isolated away from everything and you are spending time one-on-one engaged with God in his word and in prayer. Now, I know what you're saying. You're like, well, wait a second. Is it, so Jesus, he got up before daybreak? Are you kidding me? So are you saying, are you saying I gotta get up before the sun is up? Because if that's the case, I'm out. <laughs> that ain't me, preacher. Hey, it's, it's, it's okay. You don't have to do that. Jesus prayed at other times as well. And I'm, a, I'm an up before the dawn. Maybe in your neighborhood gathering, raise your hand. Just look around. Who's, who's an up before the dawn person? Okay. How many of you are like, yeah, I, I am not up before the dawn? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. See, you look around. We're all, we're all different. In fact, I get up before the dawn. I just love that. I love to, I love to have the, the day chasing me. I don't want to chase the day. And so I'm up, I'm in the word of God before the sun is up. Laura, not a chance. There's no way that she's doing that. In fact, she says, listen, I'm not up because Jesus isn't up. (laughs) That's what she says. I'm not up because Jesus isn't up. She says, so it doesn't matter when it is, but do you have a time? Do you have a place? Because God has a mission for you. Come on, turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering, tell them, God has a mission for you. God has a mission for you, and his mission is found in his word. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them, hey, his mission is found in his word. His mission is found in his word. Man, we need to be studying the word of God. But Jesus, would he would engage with the one, and then he would go out and he would serve someone. Look at Acts 10, 38. It says, Jesus what? Say it with me in your neighborhood gathering. He went around doing good. Oh, turn to somebody and tell them, do some good today. Do some good today. He he was healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. These are the stories that we are drawn to. These are the stories that we love. we're We're not drawn so much to the crowd stories, but we love these stories of the woman at the well and the woman who was caught in adultery and how Jesus forgave her, how he healed the lepers, the man on the mat who was lowered down, the little girl that he raised from the dead. We're drawn to these stories, and the reason we're drawn to these stories is because we see ourselves in those stories. Well, guess what? Jesus is calling you and I to do the same. What would it look like if every day you looked for an opportunity to do good in the name of Jesus? Like, what do I mean by that? I mean, just sometimes it's a simple little thing like saying hi to somebody, acknowledging their existence. Like, instead of just walking by them, you, you say hi. Maybe it's, maybe it's meeting a need tangibly, or maybe, maybe it's just an act of kindness. God presents all of these opportunities, and when you're in his word, and then you're watching, you're going to see those opportunities. I was talking to someone in our church recently, and they were telling me about their wife, and she was at work, and there was a single mom, and this single mom was sharing how she just wasn't making it during the pandemic. And his wife gave this single mom her entire paycheck because that's what God told her to do. That's what God is calling us to do, from the simple to the sacrificial. 
What is God calling you to do? We can all serve somebody. Come on, turn to somebody wherever you are and say, it's time to engage. It's time to engage. So engage with one. Next one is this, engage with three. Engage with three, support and share. Support and share. We know that Jesus had his 12 apostles, but what is often overlooked as well is Jesus had three that three men that he was very, very close to, Peter, James, and John. And he would often pull them aside, and they knew things about him that no one else knew. In fact, that little girl I talked about that was raised from the dead, it was Peter, James, and John. They were the only ones who went into the room. They were the only ones who witnessed that happening. There was a time where Jesus was up on a mountain, and Moses and Elijah appeared. And the only ones who were there that saw that, Peter, James, and John. And when Jesus was praying in the garden with the 12, he took Peter, James, and John aside, and they were the ones where we read about Jesus was so anguished, he was sweating drops of blood, that the ones who saw that were Peter, James, and John. In fact, look at what, how Matthew uh, uh, tells the story of the praying in the garden. He says this in Matthew 4, 19, I'm sorry, in uh, Matthew 26, 37. He took Peter and James and John, and he became what? Anguished and distressed. Like, do you have three friends? Do you have three people in your life? They know you. You're connected with them. They, they support you where you're finding support, where they've seen you anguished and distressed. Like, I've talked often about my three, my Peter, James, and John, Matt, Matt, Rusty, and Blaine. These guys know everything about me. I know everything about them. We support each other. We encourage each other. We're praying for one another. I mean, uh, we know each other's junk in the trunk, right? I ain't talking about this junk in the trunk here, okay? I'm talking about, like, I know your junk, you know my junk, you tell on me, I tell on you. That kind of, do you have that level of friendship with somebody? Men, do you have a Peter, James, and John? Ladies, do you have a Salome, a Mary, and a Mary? And you're like, wait, who's that? Those are the three ladies that were closely tied to one another. They were there at the crucifixion. They were there, and they saw Jesus raised from the dead. Men, you need three men. Ladies, you need three ladies in your life. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them it's time to engage. It's time to engage. You need the support, because Jesus had the support of Peter, James, and John. But, but Peter, James, and John, they were also the first that he shared the gospel with. So you need three that you share the gospel with. Matthew 4, 19 tells us when he called them, Jesus said this, come follow me. I'll show you how to fish for people. Jesus calls all of us to share the gospel. Come on, turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering and say, hey, we're all in this together. We are all in this together. And I, I know you, th Brad, I, 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 I <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. I wouldn't know what to do. I'm not the preacher. I'm not trained. Hey, if you've been a part of Core Church for any amount of time, you know that we make the gospel way too complicated. And we've just simplified it here at Core Church. All you got to do is remember three things. I want you to write these down. Intercede, invest, inform. Intercede, invest, and inform. Two of those you are responsible for one, the Holy Spirit is responsible for. First two, you're responsible for. Intercede. Before you ever think about sharing your faith, you gotta pray. In fact, I tell you, if you're not praying, please don't share your faith, okay? You're the crazy ones. You're the ones that are making it hard on the rest of us. You're the ones that are making it very, very difficult. You're always gonna be frustrated. You're always gonna feel guilty. And listen, first thing you do, start praying. Do you have neighbors, coworkers, classmates, people at the school, on the ball field, people that you say, I'm praying for these people, three people I'm praying for by name. So you're praying for people. Then invest, talked about this earlier, just a few moments ago. Just go and do good. Just look for opportunities just to be kind. No, no hidden agenda. I'm not trying to work the gospel in somewhere. I'm not trying to convert them in this moment. I'm just trying to show the tangible love of Jesus to them. Just, just do good in the name of Jesus. And the third one is the Holy Spirit's responsibility. So you don't ever have to worry about trying to work Jesus into a conversation. Worst thing you can do, by the way, is work Jesus into a conversation. Woo, man, do you know what? It's, it's so hot, it's so hot. You know where else it's hot? Hell. <laughs> never plays, never works out. Let the Holy Spirit do it. Because guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna come to you, they're gonna have questions. They're gonna come to you and they're gonna say something. And you're gonna know, oh, this is, this is the moment. Turn to somebody wherever you are and tell them, it's time to engage. It's time to engage. 
Next one is this, write this down, engage with 12. Engage with 12, faith and friendship. Faith and friendship. Love this about Jesus. Jesus had friends. He had a group of guys, 12 disciples, that he did life with. He was always pulling them aside from the crowd. They were teaching, there was teaching going on. They, they, would, uh, they did ministry together, they served together, they laughed together, they ate together. Jesus did life with them. It says this in Matthew 20, 17. He took the 12 disciples aside what? Privately. Privately. If 2020 has revealed anything, it has revealed the great deception of the enemy is isolation. If you right now are watching this by yourself, you are right where the enemy wants you. He wants you in isolation because isolation kills. We were created for community. We were created to be together. The people of God were created to gather. I don't, doesn't matter how you gather. You can gather online. You can gather through FaceTime. You can gather through whatever. You can gather through uh, Teams. Whatever it is, find a way. Fight for, I love our neighborhood gatherings right now. The people are saying, you know what? We're gonna get together. We're gonna find a way to be together in smaller gatherings. I'm telling you, that's why we have services at 9.30 right now because we're gonna fight to be together. We've gotta fight against isolation. That's why we're telling you now to get into a core group. For the next four weeks, next Sunday, we, we're gonna start core groups for core purpose. For the next four weeks, you can learn how God has wired you. Like when you go out to, to do good in the name of Jesus, how amazing would it would be if you knew your gifts, if you knew your abilities, if you knew how you were wired to serve. And every day you were able to go out and do those things that you're passionate about. We're gonna be doing that for the next four weeks. Get into a group. You can go to corechurch.com. You can sign up for a group. Engage with 12. Man, you, you need faith and you need friendship. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them it's time to engage. It's time to engage. The last one is this, engage with one another. Write this down, engage with one another, presence and purpose. Presence and purpose. We see 10 different times in the Gospels that Jesus went to the synagogue. He went to the synagogue to worship, he went to the synagogue to uh, read the scriptures, he went into the synagogue to heal, to do good, and to gather with the people of God. That's what we do on Sundays. We, we gather to experience the presence of God and be equipped for his purpose. This, we get, when you are not here, when you are not in a neighborhood gathering, listen, we need your presence. Your presence is needed because when you show up, guess what? The presence of God shows up with you. You weren't meant to just keep it to yourself, but when we come together, that's why collectively as we come together, something happens and you're like, man, I'm connected. It's because God's spirit connects our spirits together. And then as we hear the word of God together, we weren't created to hear it just by ourselves. We come together and we're like, this is the purpose. This is what God has for us. So then we can go out and we can live that out every single day. Like just imagine, Imagine if Jesus said, yeah, hey, so, um, yeah, I'm not, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to be at church this week. Um, you know, I got, uh, my sister's got a thing that I got to be at, and uh, I mean, I would, I'd be there, but you know, uh, you know, Peter's mom, remember I healed her, she's having a big celebration, and uh, I'd feel bad if I didn't show up, she happens to be having it, and I just, I've, I've got to be at that, or, hey, so yesterday, um, you know, I don't know if you heard, but I fed 5,000 people, and whoo, I am exhausted, <laughs> So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna. Jesus would never do that. So why do we do that? And I wanna encourage you, engage with worship. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them, it's time to engage. It's time to engage. So what does it look like to go from the Sunday church and become the everyday church. I want you to imagine that you got into God's word every single day. 
You were, you, imagine you, if you fought to be in the word of God because you're like, I want to be on mission. I want to know what God has to say for me. I want to know what God wants me to do today. I want to know the kind of person God wants to shape me into. And imagine every day you said, I'm going to fight for it. Imagine you're reading the word, but imagine you're getting nothing out of it. Like, you know, I'm going to talk about this next week, by the way. You're getting nothing out of it, but you're like, no, I'm coming back the next day. I'm going to keep planting the seed. I'm going to keep planting the seed. I'm going to keep planting the seed. And then imagine, imagine if every day you got up and you went out and just looked for opportunities to do good in the name of Jesus. Like when, when you saw somebody, you're like, you intentionally like said hi to them to engage them because you're like, I want them to be needed and known. It wasn't a passive hi, but it was like, you were really saying hi. You really saw them. Or maybe you saw somebody who was in need and you're like, but I could, I could help with that. Maybe it's something simple or maybe it's something sacrificial, but you're like, man, I could do that. Imagine at the end of your day, you look back on your day and you, you say, wow, look how, like, look how God used me. Wow. Then, then imagine if you had three people in your life and you were doing life with them and you had a place where you knew you could confess your sins to one another. Like you, you didn't have to fake it. You didn't have to pretend, but you could just be real and, and, and you found acceptance and you found people that would spur you on to do good things in your life and Man, just, and just imagine too, though, that you weren't only just having these three people in your life, but you said, I'm going to intentionally, every day, pray for people that don't know Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for my neighbors, my coworkers, I'm, the people on my, on my campus and in my dorm and uh, at that school. I, I'm going I'm to start praying for them. And here's what I want you to imagine. Imagine if you started doing that and you started praying for them and you, you, you then had opportunities to, to do good in their life. And nothing, I mean, you didn't talk about Jesus, but you just... You started being kind for the sake of kindness and getting to know them and just showing tangibly the love of Jesus to them. Imagine what that'd be like. And imagine if one day they came to you and they said, hey, I, I got a question. Or maybe, maybe something happens in their life and you know in that moment that's God's calling you and to talk to them about the hope that you have. And and you know it's it, and so you, you take a bold step and you just you pray for them or you text them a scripture or you just sit and listen and talk to them. And imagine you do that for weeks or maybe months and just developing this relationship and just loving this person like Jesus did. Now imagine this. Here's the big shift. Here's the big shift where we go from this to this. Imagine if instead of inviting them to church on Sunday, imagine if you said to them, hey, I've got this group of friends, and uh, we get together on Sunday nights, uh, we get together on Thursday nights, Wednesday nights, whatever night it is that your core group meets. And you say, hey, we eat together, we laugh, we hang out, um, we, we talk about th these questions and these things that we're ha talking about, and we pray together, and you want to come? Imagine if they said yes. Like they say yes, and you text everybody in your core group. You're like, my, my friend, my friend is coming to group. Can you imagine how excited your group was? Imagine your group's then praying, start praying for that person by name, and, and they show up in the group, and they show up on that night, and they walk into the room, and everybody, everybody's being kind to them. Everybody's loving on them. Everybody's being nice to them. And imagine your friend just sits down and, and they're watching all these different people and realizing that they have problems and they have struggles and they're asking questions. And imagine if uh, weeks and maybe months go by and imagine that person says, um, so am I a Christian? <laughs> um, I think I might be a Christian. I, what does it mean to be a Christian? Imagine you start talking to them. And you're fumbling through it and you're making all kinds of mistakes. You're not getting it right. Imagine like you don't call up me. You don't call up, you don't bring them to the church for the answer. You say, I'm going to try to tell them. And imagine you bring them into your group and then your group, the members of the group, they start talking to them about what it means to have faith in Jesus. And you all stumble about it together and fumble it together. And just imagine if that person in that, in your, in your core group and, and they say, uh, I want that. I, I want. I want Jesus. And 
Like imagine your core group gathering around that person and praying for them. And everybody says amen, and the tears are flowing, and the excitement is there because the old is gone and the new has come, and this person is experiencing the hope and the healing and the peace and the purpose of Jesus. Now imagine if you said, hey, your next step is to be baptized. But, but instead of bringing them to, to, to church on a Sunday to be baptized like we would do it, you say, we got a pool in the backyard. How about we just take you out there and baptize you there? And imagine that you, like, you get in the pool. Not a pastor, not the group leader, but you get in the pool because this is your neighbor, this is your coworker, this is your classmate, and imagine that you take them down under the water and you lift them up to new life and imagine everybody around that pool just going crazy. Imagine everybody in the neighborhood jumping into the pool because they can't handle it. Everybody's so excited. And imagine if you then came with your group with that person and we all gathered on a Sunday and we showed the video of you baptizing them in the pool and we all celebrated together. Come on church, it is time to engage. Turn to somebody and tell them it is time to engage. It is time to go from the Sunday church and become the everyday church.